writing is so much better today because of him. And it was, he's like, Rick, writing is one of those things that you just have to do it. You can read about it all you want to, but you're not going to improve to the level that you want to or need to until you actually do it. And you do it, and you do it, and you do it. Have somebody look at it. Have somebody mark it up for you. Have somebody give you feedback on how you can improve it. And so through emails and putting together documents and things like that, I learned, learn, learn. Plus, back here and here, I started having to do things like in Microsoft Word, a little bit Excel, but you know, back here there wasn't much. This is like you know early 80s. Time, so I wrote my, I wrote my, uh, actually I wrote my master's thesis using uh, Microsoft Word 4 on an Apple. I actually printed the thing out at one of the warehouses. Because <laughs> they had a color laser printer, right? So when I worked in the warehouse, so I, I'm taking my little Mac this, uh, yeah. Because <laughs> Costco actually, they were selling the apples back then. This was a long time ago, right? And so I think this, this here is like 94. Yeah, yeah, 94 is when I got my master's. And so, um, so those are the kinds of things that, um, that, that's what got me into technology. So I started doing programming. I'm like, oh, I love it. I'm passionate about this. I'm finding this outlet, and I was good at it. And I had no idea. I was forced to learn basic computer. You know, what's it, begin, beginner's all symbolic instruction code? Back here, I had to go to the library, get a book on uh, basic, so I could plot some program, some data that I was collecting because I needed it for my senior thesis. Right? So that's the kind of thing. So education, learning, uh, it, none of it is for naught. So even when I was sitting there taking other kinds of classes, I thought, this is a waste of my time. Why am I taking all this geography? Well, it ends up coming into play later on in life because then I can actually talk intelligently you know, as, a, as an older adult. Like now I'm in a consulting type of role, which I never would have thought I was in. Now I go and help companies strengthen their security posture for the payment card industry. That's the card swipes, you know, your debit and credit card. Okay, so now I, but I have to be able to communicate with them. I'm also, I was also a member of Toastmasters. So I don't know if any of you belong to Toastmasters or have heard about it, but if that's something that's of interest to you, I'd encourage you. It'll help you facilitate your communication skills. Because those are the kind of the two big things um, that I'm seeing these days is um, can you understand technology? Can you talk to the web app programmers? Can you talk to them about C Sharp? Can you talk to them about .NET? Can you talk to them about um, queries, things like that? But then can you also walk across the hallway and talk to the CFO about what the implications are of if this goes wrong? Having both of those skill sets, as he talked about, um, makes you even that much more valuable uh, to an organization and can help you, you know, get the kind of career or lifestyle that, that you want to have. Right? There's no guarantees, there's no silver bullets, but what I have found for me is uh, strengthening the soft skills, the communication, whether it's verbal, whether it's in writing, and being able to speak one-on-one -on -one and in larger groups as well has helped me. Uh, never would have thought of it years and years ago. Nobody told me about that, but throughout over the years, that's just how things have kind of played out. And so I love, so I love community colleges. I love education. I love to learn, but then I also like to turn that around and, and help other people uh, in, in ways that uh, will benefit them. Also. Um, with what you get through. It seems even, even in the classes on HTML5 and the jQuery that we're taking, I'm finding that uh, we're all kind of learning as we go. And so I'm assuming that with where you guys are at, you, you're, you're way up here and everybody else is trying to catch up. So how, from a community college standpoint, do you even get close to getting on par? You know, 
even understanding the terminology that you guys are starting to work with. I mean, you guys are kids going on the cutting edge of the So, like, I don't know, you know, we, we get that a lot um, on things, and as someone who's, you know, I, mean, I, I interview probably for every 100 resumes I get, I'll probably interview about 10 people, uh, and maybe we'll put out offers for one or two, right? And uh, so we've kind of refined that. We've kind of said, you know, what, what, what am I looking for as an employer? I mean, now, as well, Rick, Rick says, you have to have a certain layer of technology, and specifically if you've got certain compensation ranges. For people that are very open, um, it really has nothing to do with it. What, we look, what we're looking at is, I mean, you look at, you know, I was an economics background. Rick was a physics background. What I'm looking for, and you can kind of see what we, what we kind of attract, we look for one, people that you enjoy working with. So you see this a lot of times where, I mean, there's a lot of guys that are a lot smarter than me uh, that know how to do things, but companies don't want to hire them because they're not fun to work with. Right. So one of the first things we look for is, you know, do I want to work with that person? Because, I, you know, we're not a government job. But I don't like working someone we don't have to. So that's one, one of the skill sets that we're looking for is surrounding ourselves with people, again, kind of goes back to similar interests. And so part of the things that we're looking for is, you know, we, why are you? So you guys mentioned that you're doing all these things. But you didn't mention why. So why are you guys studying this? It's a blast. I mean, what else? OK. What, what other reasons? Why are you guys technically studying these courses? Uh, it's career change. It's, it's, a, it's a career art, getting into this stuff so you can move forward into the industry, you move forward into getting involved with people who have similar interests and actually being able to do some fun stuff and build, build it. Okay. Any other thoughts on why you guys are taking that? Um, <clears throat> I've been studying web apps uh, because I like to empower uh, folks, uh, business owners, individuals, community, group uh, presidents to um, utilize all the technology that's coming together uh, so that they can uh, further their cause, right. whatever that may be. You know, to make a profit, to, to serve the community, uh, to get a job, you know, yeah. as an individual. Absolutely. So if you ever see my desktop, I don't know if you ever I got a black desktop, and I got one line at the bottom that I have for a couple years now. And I, I use that every day to kind of remind myself. And that line is, this is what you could have done. Right? So while I know I can go through something, I can get through to agree or do something, I'm always thinking about what what could I have done with my life? You know, why am I here? Not getting kind of too much of the you know philosophical or religion. That is something that you know, what I find is as we're looking with folks that want to get into our industry, um, it's not the most technical, not the guys. What we're looking for is we're looking for people that have a passion about something. And if you're passionate about it, it's going to show up in a lot of things you do. You can't be passionate about web application and probably you know not be involved in other areas that you know cause you you'll need to start building a fundamental. So you may you may hate. SQL and back. But you know it's critical in order for you to build an application. Or you may be a .NET person, you need to learn Apache, and you don't know anything about Apache, but you realize you have to do it. That, that shows really anything that you do. And so it's one of the interview questions I'm always asking, what are you most proud of? And what we're looking for and we're asking people that is we're, we're seeing the, the challenges and people taking things that they didn't want to do or they didn't think they were doing, um, getting those together and moving forward. And those are the guys, and one of the guys who's hired, Colin Schuler, he's 22 years old, and Rick and I were just talking about how awesome he is as a, as a hire. And uh, he he isn't even an IT guy, really. He was a, uh, what is his, he was an accounting major. Yeah, he's account he, he, he recently graduated with his accounting degree. Yeah, so he recently graduated with his accounting degree. His his dad was uh, my commanding officer in the reserves. And so, again, this is kind of the networking, right? His dad called me and said, hey, Tom, my son just graduated. Not, I knew your company was hiring. I'm not sure if he's a fit. I said, I, I looked at a bunch of things. I said, well, as an accounting major, it probably wouldn't be a good fit. But what attracted me to, to Colin was, he was some, when I asked him about kind of what he did, he re what really struck me was that, again, he was passionate to learn about things, where he wanted to go, and his vision of where he wanted to be two years from now and five years from now is exactly what he's done. And I can tell you right now what he's doing is he's helping us um, with some of the things that I'm working with. I'm working with intelligence agencies on how they're stopping uh, other countries from spying on us and turning <coughs> their drones remotely, those sort of things, right? I'm working with folks like, you know, Oracle and Microsoft and VMware on their strategies around security because all those guys have created great applications and now security compliance is like the number one prohibitor from people moving to the cloud or if you get applications, it's all, is it secure? Is it going to be breached? So all of a sudden, this, you know, this niche of security is becoming more than just something, it's, it's something that unless you can figure out how to do it, it's really holding you back. And that's what we're finding is, you know, we, we go in places that have, I remember the first time thinking about that, I was going and doing a security assessment with a bunch of, um, you know, at Oracle, 
to Oracle database administrators, right? So just like you said, how do, what value do I bring going to a company like Oracle interviewing database administrators and what they're doing? Well, the thing that they were lacking is they didn't understand kind of how everything worked together, right? So I could understand their little pieces and say, well, I don't know if you guys know, but these are some of the regulations and this is what these other guys are doing and this is why you guys should change some of those things. So I guess kind of the short answer to your question, how do you get there is, is just stay passionate about what you're doing. Um, keep on trying to broaden your, your, your skill set and what you're doing, and you will naturally, I think, end up finding your, yourself into a position that you want. And it may, like Rick said, it may be something that you had no idea you know, what you're going to, uh, or maybe something that you were at. My dad was a, an accountant and an auditor. I remember thinking, I will never do that. That, that sounds horrible. Uh, he had the little <laughs> green hat to like, balance things out, and uh, I never thought I'd do that, but now you know I do it, and I think from the name of Rick had, the reason we do this is because we enjoy this because we actually help companies with their problems. We help large, complicated companies with big problems, and uh, and as part of that, you know, we're in a, in a unique position. I think in the next three or six years, where there's a lot of people that really need a lot of help. So you guys are in a good position because if you're looking at doing a career transition or or, or wanting to move up or something, you guys are just in, in a fantastic spot right now where there's a huge need and the market is changing and, and you can accelerate your career. I think more than any other any other time. I wanted you guys to talk a little bit about the role of internships or getting some of that professional experience, um, whether it's a formal internship or just working, you know, volunteer for, for some <coughs> company to gain some experience and get some letters of reference. How important is that in your, in your hiring process or in your backgrounds? You go first. Um, well, for me, me personally, I haven't worked with a lot of folks from an internship perspective. When, um, in some of the areas where I've been, it's hard from a security perspective to be an intern in some of that because it requires um, maybe additional background check or things that, you know, an investment that could be difficult to do or, you know, there was kind of a, I don't want to say by policy, but if you're, if you're trying to investigate attacks that are coming into your website or across your network, internships are kind of hard to get in that particular area. There's other areas where you could could be um, be more successful in that. But I guess it would kind of depend on the person's background and really kind of where, where things were headed with that. Yeah, I think um, what I think is, is really to get the experience, what I've done, and I was actually thinking about so to see whiteboard or something, I feel like I got a whiteboard or something. <laughs> so let me so let me say if you guys wanted to, and I thought about this two years ago, I wanted to create the leading cloud practice in the country for security. I remember thinking with this guy that I had, that this other guy I hired, Mike, let's just build this. Let's build the 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 group that leading cloud providers want to go and talk to when they have That was our goal two years ago. How would you go about doing that? You had a goal. Do you want to be, you know, develop the best website or the best? How, how would you guys do that? What, are the, what thoughts would you guys have? If that was a goal that you guys wanted to set up. Okay, networking is one. See who's doing it already. See who's doing it. Talk to them. So, so that's what we did. So we looked at as cloud computing was going, and we realized that nobody was doing it. Right? We looked and we said, uh, I don't know if you guys have done this, but you know, so for kind of some basic MBA stuff, they look at. You kind of look at something, and this might be, you know, things that you 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 can do or your company can do. This is stuff that competitors can do, right? And these are kind of, uh, you know, collaborators. And so, what a lot of folks are, are doing is they go and they find, you know, what are other competitors doing? What are other partners are doing? And how do we go and get that part of the pie, right? So a lot of the, the fighting you see is going on here, but the the value of what you really want to do is you you want to do this. You want to find a position. In the, in the market or in your career where you have something, you have people that know that you do that, and you have competitors that can't do what you do. And that's what we set out to do is we said, you know what, what do, what do we have that other people don't have? And I said, well, I think one thing we have is we have this unique mix of military and commercial experience. So what we found is there's a lot of military contractors out there, Booz Allen, SAIC, all these other guys, they do a lot of military contracting, right? Then there's a lot of commercial guys, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Oracle, they all do their own things. But there wasn't a lot of people that understood both. We found people spent 30 years in one or 30 years in another. Hey, you know, there's probably a good niche because you have this. The second thing is 
you know, I'm not 50 years old. I can't compete against someone that's got 30 years of experience on something. So I said, what's the other niche where maybe not having 20 years of experience isn't as as critical? Where maybe kind of why why would someone within our skill set really be the area you want to go to? And that we said, you know, stop competing is great because you know, it, it comes, you have to have a, a broad skill set of what you need to have. Uh, and you need to be relevant with new technology. So a lot of people that have 30 years experience are sick of learning, right? <laughs> they don't want to relearn the newest gadget and that stuff. They're very, they're very happy, and some aren't. Um, and then the other part is just the energy, right? So all right, we will work harder than those guys and create something. So what we did is, you know, how, how I built, so I, I would say I have now the largest, the best, I definitely have the largest independent cloud consulting group right now. We're doing, uh, we're one of four companies that were allowed to certify federal cloud for the federal government. Uh, I've got about a dozen customers, everyone from CenturyLink, uh, Zavis, Quest, Amazon, or not Amazon, but I know the folks at Amazon, I'm working with them. There's Microsoft, there's uh, other companies like Firehost and, and these other ones we have. So I've got about 20 different folks that I, uh, I work with, and that happened all because in basically happened in 2004. I heard about something called virtualization. I didn't know what it was. And so guess what I did? I heard, I want to learn more about it. I heard about this organization called CIS, the Center for International Security. I joined a mailing list and I just contributed some time to it. That, in 2004, I started working on this benchmark. And if you look at it, you can, you can look at it. It's this ESXi, ESX benchmark that I was one of the contributing authors to. So you guys see, the good part is there's a lot of communities out there right now if you're interested in doing something, you can just join. They're free to join, and you end up surrounding yourself. What happened as part of that is I ended up meeting this guy called uh, Charu, who ended up then working for VMware a little bit later. And as he left VMware, he called me up in 2008 and said, hey, Tom, you know, I understand we're doing some stuff. And I see you're doing regulatory stuff. Can you help VMware write some white papers? So I helped write some white papers in 2008. Um, and that basically led to how VMware is dealing with so if you go to like VMware's white paper, I started with payment card industry compliance. As part of that, that white paper got some good notoriety, uh, and he said, well, can you come and present at VMworld? So in 2010, I ended up presenting at VMworld. Uh, and if you guys have never been there, VMworld has about 20,000 people that show up. So my presentation I gave, I gave here and in Copenhagen, I ended up presenting this paper to about 2,000 people. Uh, as part of that, um, other folks heard about this, HP, IBM, maybe you've heard about some of these guys. Uh, these guys saw that we were doing said, hey, we got the same challenge as VMware. We want to work on this paper too. So that now led to other things that, that, are, uh, that are going on that's leaving me. I'm doing a uh, presentation now at, at RSA. I'm dealing with the Cloud Security Alliance. This led to the uh, intelligence community uh, thing. So all these things track because basically you know, I didn't know how this stuff would work out, but basically eight years ago, I volunteered my time to help out with a benchmark, work with the community, and started understanding some of the fundamentals. And those guys, I mean, this, if you look at that list, those guys are the influencers now, eight years later. Um, and it's amazing in that in the security world, there's it's a pretty, it's a, let's say it's a tight-knit group, but there's a small number of people that kind of know each other and really influence. And if you look at it, you tie those up, it's amazing how many people are tied back to companies like at stake or Leviathan or some of those things. And that's what's interesting to me is I feel like I look around the whole fire and I say that's what's gonna happen. I think five or ten years from now people are gonna look at the people we have and say, wow, I can't believe that all those people were together in one place or you know you, you were creating something that was uh, unique. So that's something I guess I would say is if you're looking to start and you want to get on, you know, join one of these things, contribute, give back your knowledge. Other people want to share their knowledge with you and it will it will it's just gonna be a great accelerator. Um, I've heard a lot about uh, Node.js lately. Uh, I was wondering if you guys are familiar with that or use it, because it seems like over the last four years or so, it's an event-driven uh, JavaScript server. Have you dealt with it that much? So I guess uh, Azure is using it, Microsoft adopted it, and they using it. So what do you guys are taking it to? Yeah, so you're talking in an area, so this is good. the other good part about consulting is to say when you don't know something. So I don't know that, but I can tell you, I think, was something that's interesting that I'm finding that you guys might find. And, and so what I'm doing is, you know, I never knew that virtualization was going to lead to kind of cloud computing and all that stuff. Here's what, here's what I do think is happening, and you guys feel free to disagree with me. 
Uh, right now, as people are moving to, to cloud computing and, and things like that, what we're doing is we're taking physical infrastructure and we're virtualizing that. Um, we're taking networking gear and virtualizing it so that a Cisco switcher is becoming an X2000B, which has virtualization technology. You're taking physical servers and, and translating them. And the applications that we're developing are still being developed with the, the mindset that they're running on code that's on operating systems um, that are built to do this stuff. What we're finding is, why, why deal with that, right? Right now, you basically, you got an infrastructure that you're, you're dealing with right here. Uh, you know, in cloud view, they call it infrastructure as a service. Um, then they got platform as a service, this is like your IIS server or, or Apache or something like that. And then what you're doing is you're dealing with the application like Right, and, and what people are doing, I mean, we saw this back in the, because I still dealt with the Navy, right? People develop an application with a certain OS in mind. I can't tell you how many people can't upgrade from Windows NT because they're using this little application that requires you to run as a local administrator and only runs on Windows NT, right? So they designed those, and I think those were some, those are some of the issues that we found in the Navy and in some of the classified areas is it's great when you adopt new technology, if you don't think about how things are going to evolve, you end up getting stuck. So the, the things that are happening right now is you're developing these applications, but as we're developing these, there's a virtual machine, and if you think about this, if you take your Windows machine and you virtualize it, it is just a, a file, it's a software file. It's called an OVF, an open vir, uh, virtualization format, where you're taking something that's just, all it is is software. We're creating a lot of these things and just creating it's just software based. And if you have that and you say, well, the platform really is just a bunch of software. If, the, if you can take a, Windows 2008 server and do all that stuff, and it's just software, why would you just develop applications that are agnostic from the platform and just directly interact here? In the future, why don't we create applications and code that it doesn't uh, rely on what platform they're running? You can run it across different clouds. That's something that's happening right now. When you look at like, uh, when you see some of the Google servers, and you see some of those things right there, that's the advances that people are making right now. So that's kind of the unique thing you guys can think about within applications is you can continue doing, you know, going after SQL, going after some of those things. But at the end of the day, is there a way that would be more efficient that we can do that now? How computing kind of takes on? How will that change uh, where you are going? Uh, how, what are those things? And then, you know, within that niche, look for different communities that are looking for different tool sets and, and, and things that you're doing. And you can start tracking those to see if they're getting traction. And that can then allow you to get a good niche that when someone like Microsoft says, we need someone that has experience doing something this way or something. You get that, that little niche because you've been supporting it. So I think this is going to be kind of a unique uh, a, a unique thing. And the other part, really, from the application side is really that, that transition to mobile. So <coughs> mobile applications, the other areas, once you, you know, you've taken all this stuff and put it in the cloud, what is the difference between a desktop, a, an iPad, and an iPhone? Right? If it's just using a browser, <coughs> yeah, if it's using a browser, and that browser doesn't care about the underlying operating system, who really cares? So how's that going to change our technology in the future, right? You may create you may create something and it's got to run on a refrigerator just as much as it's got to run on, on a uh, on a desktop, right? Those are the things that are happening right now that are, that are going on. I can tell you that right now we've got this deal. Think about this. We've got the administration group loves this. We're dealing with a major automotive company, you know, one of the, the big four that kind of came to us because they said, hey. We're to the point, all this new technology in our cars. Our cars are going to be IP enabled, they're going to have internet based. What are the risks? So before we had worried about these things, but now you've seen an OnStar has been hacked and people are turning off cars, right? You can break into police cars remotely. So as all that stuff's happening, all of a sudden the value from application developers and what they're doing uh, is a big deal. You find that there's right now a lot of people, and we're probably interested in you, you guys want to create something, right? You wanted to develop applications that do something and make the world better. Um, what happens is a lot of those applications, though, and I'm not sure how much. Do you guys get any security training? What you guys are doing, or much? Do you guys know about OWASP Top Ten or any of that stuff? So what? If you develop an awesome application, and it turns out the whole world starts using it, and then it gets hacked. That's happened, you know, with Facebook not too long ago, where they the, an application flaw that they had uh, basically allowed someone to circumvent some stuff. So for me, is if you really want to be passionate about something, you want it to work, you have to ensure that it works correctly. And now, you know, that's, that's a big thing that's happening. Because, like, people have a lot of great ideas, but you can't demonstrate that it's going to work correctly, or you haven't thought about the functionalities, like logging and monitoring. Don't do logging and monitoring just for the sake of troubleshooting. What happens if there is an incident? Are you logging the thing that can allow someone to kind of uh, take things through? Because now, all the forensics that we used to do, we used to go and take a, take a computer, take <coughs> an image of it, you can't do that in, in Azure. 
right? You can't go to Microsoft and take images of terabytes and terabytes of data and say, what you're doing is you're actually following application logic now to figure out what happened and how people were up and broke anything. So there's some, I mean, some really unique things, and really when I kind of look at my skill set and all the things that I have, this is the one that you're, you know, application security is probably the one that I'm definitely weakest in. I mean, I've done some coding and I've done, I've done some things, but it's, you know, I don't, I don't enjoy sitting in front of a monitor and just typing away in code. I like making things work, which is why I hate it, because once I start developing it, developing something, I will just work all night long until I make it work. So that's kind of the bad part, but it's interesting. So when you think about that, this, this is the thing is, I, I think you guys are gonna find if you guys wanna compete in the application space, um, the newer newer things out there, security is gonna continue to be a, a hot thing, and then mobile devices are gonna continue to be something that's hot. So if you guys can look at that, you know, I would suggest you guys focus on mobile technology and uh, integrating some of the, the fundamentals of security, and you guys think that there's gonna be a huge thing out there. How do you guys know what about some of the estimates about 50% of the IT jobs that exist today won't exist in about two years. Um, and, and part of that is because as this goes away, <coughs> uh, our company used to need five people to manage exchange. Outsource the cloud now, you don't need those five people. What do you need? You need people that can help your business run. What are those guys going to do? They're going to customize applications. They're going to customize things for you, right? So even though there's 50% less jobs, the skill sets are, are, are different. You guys are, I think, in one of the uh, the, the two skill sets that I see kind of IT evolving around are application security and virtualization technologies. So you guys are, I think, are 50% half of the, the field that's around. Did you have a question? Or you yeah, I did. Kind of more of a non-general, non-technical question kind of directed, Rick. Um, uh, so we're looking at your path to success and, you know, where you started, I guess, your job from Price Club, I guess, going over to Costco. It sounds like if there's there's an element of being at the right place at the right time. How, how important is that to you know be in a company that will give you an opportunity to be able to develop and get those skills? Or if I pick a company that really doesn't have that kind of future, I mean, do, do, could could I still you know succeed like you have? I would say absolutely. You can you can you can be successful regardless of where you're at. Um, and I would say that <coughs> if you if you're currently with a, a company that you're not doing what you're passionate about, then I would say start to look where there's opportunities for that. Because um, you could be be someplace and, and it's fitting that need, right? It allows you to pay the bills, it allows you to feed your family, and it allows you to have whatever creative outlet that you're interested in. Right? When, once you have kind of your, I'll just speak for myself, once I have my basic needs met, then I'm looking at um, you know, what can I do that is the interest? And from interest for me is, am I delivering value in what I'm doing? Because I don't want to do something just to do it. I want to do it because it's personally rewarding and it is providing value to the company that I'm working with. And then it may get to a place where, okay, I don't see where I can grow any further here. And that's when you have to make all these decisions of, do I stay where I'm at? because it pays the bills and I'll just do that till I retire? Or do I have an opportunity to go do something else where I can continue on that growth path? And so for me coming over to Coal Fire, it's an extension. Um, I never would have seen it, like I mentioned, I never would have seen myself in that spot way back when, but all of that experience, all of the education, all the continual learning, because I, I was a programmer for a time. And then I, I left Costco one other time and went to a, a smaller company that wrote the first native web server for the i-series, for the AS400. And that's where I learned HTML and JavaScript. I had to learn WML for the wireless market language. I had to learn WML over the weekend for a sales presentation on Monday. So like on a Thursday, I'm, I'm told, okay, you need to make this application work for a, a cell phone, right? The display's only like this big. Oh, go to WAP, uh, you know, WAP dot whatever. You know, you get a little phone simulator. So I was testing my code there, but that was like on a Thursday. I was told by Monday they want to do this presentation to a large company on the East Coast. So because I have continued to learn, and I love it, but, you know, being able to problem solve, and I think that that's kind of tying into what Tom was talking about, it, it got me thinking and reminded me of being able to problem solve. Whether you're working in accounting, whether you're working in IT, 
whether you're doing some other thing, if you can solve business problems, then you're going to have greater opportunities, especially if your boss or people around you know that. I used to be very quiet. I used to think that, okay, I'll just be really good and I'll just do my thing and I won't do much fanfare, right? Well, then you watch these people around you get promoted and you're like going, wait a minute, wait a minute. So not being self-promoting per se, but just realizing that there is an element to, you know, people knowing about you without being, you know, a, a braggart about it. Right? Being confident is probably the best thing you can do overall. Is be good at what you do, and if you're doing something you don't like, maybe look at if you can doing something else. But following after something you're passionate about, if you find that niche. And just you know, go at it with with everything you have. And yes, it is very important. Or being in the right place at the right time. Or you know, I never thought a couple of years ago when I met Tom that I'd actually be working with him at the same place because I was over, I was quite happy doing what I was doing over you know, at the retailer. So you also would have been happy to come work three years ago if we were different companies then too, right? So I think a lot, a lot of that is, like you said, it is. It is being persistent. And the, other, the other thing I really thought about is, you know, it was one of the, so in addition to IT and my MBA, I actually took a couple classes. I actually wanted to be a religious education teacher. So I actually took a couple classes in ethics and uh, the Old Testament down at the University of San Diego. And one of the things I really liked about that is one of the ones I took about, they really talked about kind of who you are and what you do. One of the things that stuck out to me is, you know, when you have bonus effects, you're going to see Super Bowl quarterbacks play this this time. And there's obviously an element of luck in what they do, being in the right place at the right time. But they didn't get there, you know, very rarely does someone just luck out for no reason at all. Maybe, you know, winning the lottery is probably going to be the, the one thing. But when you look at it, you do it, usually you, you've done and you've built yourself so you have those opportunities to get there. And one of the things that someone asked me about, you know, wow, I thought I was doing a pretty good job. And they said, Tom, what are the things that you do every day and every week? Right? You eat every day. You go to the bathroom every day. You take a shower every day. Those are things that you do. That that defines who you are and what your character is. And so if you say, yeah, it's great, you know, I give back. We say, well, how often do you give back? Do you do that every day? Do you send an email out every day? Do you spend your time every day doing something every day, every week? If you do that every day, every week, it becomes who you are and it increases the chances that you're going to luck out and connect with something. If you just wait for those opportunities to pop up, then, then you're never going to happen. And so, like, for example, there's some basic things that I do every day that I do spend at least half an hour of every day helping someone out for no reason. You're just a customer that wants to know about something or, you know, just simulate you build the same. Ask me if I know about some technology or something, but I'll go and I'll look at it. So spend half an hour every day helping someone out. And, you know, I usually end up helping out. You know, I also then will also send at least three emails every day to existing customers, employees, half people that I've worked with. So I do that every day. Uh, and those are kind of little habits that I start my day off. It's just amazing. Today, my day is filled from all the little reach outs that I did yesterday and the day before. Um, and so those little things just kind of allow you to keep going. And it's easy to, I, mean, I can tell you it's easy. I've got four month old twins. I've got a two year old. I work about 70 hours a week. I traveled 30,000 miles in January. Uh, it's easy for me to say that I don't have time to do those things but I ingrain it into my character and I make sure that I find the time to do that every day without exception. That was one of the things that I most probably learned that like football growing up is all the fundamentals that you do kind of all, 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 all How are we doing on time? I think uh, it's pizza's here. Pizza's here. So I think we'll uh, break at this point and uh, can continue the conversation individually with uh, folks here. And, and as a reminder, Wednesday from 11 to 1, we have the Next Generation IT Club. So, we to help out, network, and uh, learn some more. So thank you. Thank you.